I am Nick Kaliva from Earthworks Landscaping, and I am a hardscaper. All right, Nick, let's get started to get to know more about yourself and how you got started in this industry. Can you give our audience a little bit of a context on yourself? Yeah, sure, sure, Mike. Um, thanks for thanks for having me on the podcast. Really excited to to do this. Uh, um, so, a little bit about me. Uh, I got started in the business because my my father started a landscaping business back in 1978 um, here in Western Wisconsin. So, I grew up in the in the business. Um, that's all I've really known my whole life, I guess. Um, being that we live. Um, at the business, our office and our house are on the same property. Um, we also have a retail nursery business. Um, so growing up, uh, working, working for my dad, um, you know, starting off in the nursery, um, watering plants and things like that. And then eventually when I got old enough going out on landscape crews, um, doing all types of landscaping, softscapes, hardscapes and everything. Um, and then from there, uh, once I, once I got done with high school, uh, moved out to Oregon, um, didn't really know if landscaping was what I wanted to do, but wanted to explore, um, you know, other, other parts of life, I guess, and, and, uh, you know, do, do some other things, but, um, the whole time kind of still focusing schooling and things like that on landscaping. Um, ended up spending a couple winters out in Oregon and then eventually moved back and came back to work for my dad um, pretty much full time. I think that was 2000, 2002 um, and have been basically leading landscape crews and, and doing all aspects of design and sales and everything since then. So that's, that's a little bit of background about me. And we we haven't had too many guests on the show where they talk about that, you know, they, they've kind of grown up in the business. It's uh, it's definitely something that's foreign to me because I, I didn't find out about this industry really until uh, after high school. And so I want to kind of pick your brain about this a little bit. Like, what was it? What was it like kind of coming up with your with your dad and, and working in your dad's business? What what kind of things did you see that you've you found yourself kind of implementing into your business today uh, because of what you've learned from that experience? Well, my dad um, is one of those old school dudes that really all he knows is work um, and basically spends all of his time reading, um, working, and just fully engulfed in the business. Um, so, so that has, has, uh, he's been a, a mentor really for me, um, growing up, you know, just instilling a, a hard, you know, a hardworking sense attitude and, and things like that. Um, so, so, I mean, yeah, it, it is probably a lot different than, than some of the other speakers that you've had on, on the podcast. Um, so, you know, um, I think it's, I think it's kind of sets me apart maybe from, from some of the, some of the other guys that are just kind of up and coming or, or just getting started in the business. Um, but I guess I'm, I'm really lucky that way too, that I, I grew up with a, you know, a hardworking father that, that had a successful business um, that was, you know, willing to, to let me um, come along with him and, and build the business. Um, so, you, you know, just, just that, uh, that, that, that hard, that sense of hard work um, and the work ethic, I think has gone a long way and, and really helped me in, in my landscaping career. So. Definitely. Especially as a business owner to learn and, and to learn that work ethic from example uh, with with having a nursery and being able to operate your landscaping company, what what came first? Actually, first of all, was it was it the landscaping company or was it the nursery? Well, I think the nursery um, just you know evolved. Um, back back when my dad started the business, he actually started it with his with his brother. Um, and, and his brother worked for a couple of years and then decided that he wanted to move out, out West and, and do something else. So my dad and mom, um, kind of bought him out and, and went off on their own. And, uh, you know, it, 
more efficient for us and a lot easier to, to source and grow our own plant material and also have, you know, bins full of rock and things like that. So, so the retail nursery business kind of, I think, grew out of necessity um, and efficiency. Um, and, and it, you know, obviously it's a, it's a nice little source of, of revenue as well. Um, most of the time in the spring and early summer. Um, but it, it really um, helps, helps the landscape crews. Um, and even in, in the design work that we do, we can kind of design with what inventory we have and things like that as far as what plants and things that we're putting into our landscaping plan. So I, I, the landscaping business came first, but the nursery grew you know, shortly after that um, when, when my dad was kind of just getting going. So and it's been around ever since I can remember. So, and with that nursery, um, is it is it really uh, does it does it add efficiency to your landscaping business to be able to have something like that? Is it is it worthwhile to kind of operate that, <laughs> or is that kind of that's that's been a that's been a source of uh, you know some some deep discussion probably over the course of the last 10 years whether or not it makes sense to have the nursery um we we still have it so obviously it's 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 doing okay i mean this year um revenue grew um uh, a little bit compared to the last couple which is good and and you know i i guess it's it's a it's a lot of work um we do have to hire extra employees part-time employees to kind of you know take care of the nursery we have a, you know, at my house, um, we have five acres here. So the nursery, my house, the shop and everything is on five acres, but we have an extensive, what I call a demo garden. It's basically my front and backyard, but it's, it's plants that we love. It's, it's hardscape since installations that we've built and demoed and, um, rebuilt and things like that. Um, so does it make us money? Meh it maybe it, we might break even on it. Um, but the, the, the thing that I think it really helps with is I don't have to send a crew to my local suppliers or my local nurseries every morning or every time we're doing planting jobs or every time we need rock mulch or whatever, we have it all here. We have it delivered. So I think the efficiency comes where I can just back out of my shop, load up a truck full of plants or mulch or whatever, and be on my way. Whereas some of my competitors or some other, you know, companies around don't have that luxury to be able to, to do that and are, are spending a lot of time, you know, driving and getting stuck in traffic and things like that. So that's where I think it, it really plays in efficiency wise. Um, but <laughs> there, there have been some, some deep discussions, like I said, about whether or not it, it makes sense just because it's so much work um, to keep keep everything alive. And, um, and then also having to deal with, with the retail customers. I mean, not that, not that that's a bad thing, but I mean, living at the place that you work, it's like you're on full time. You know what I mean? It's, you don't really have any downtime, you know, people driving past the close sign saying, Oh, I saw your cars in the driveway. I thought you might be open when we've been closed for a couple hours. You know what I mean? So it's, there's that too. So, um, but, I mean, for now, it it's been it's it's been good. Um, I think we'll we'll keep it most likely for the, you know, moving forward. Um, but it's something that that we definitely look at and that I think about a lot whether or not it makes sense to have. And we have cut back actually um, inventory. We used to carry a lot more inventory. Um, so I mean, there's obviously a, a ton of overhead with that and things like that. So if we can cut down on our on our inventory and cut down on our overhead that really helps out a lot too so yeah and i ask out of you know personal interest because it, it, when i think about it if if you're going to be putting out the money to have a yard to store your equipment and everything like that you know you might as well almost and i mean this is where i would ask you is you, you might as well almost try to you know turn that into some sort of retail spot or to try mm -hmm. to you know at least break even on it like you said and, right. and make maybe a little bit more money um mm -hmm. as opposed to just 
dishing out money un- unless maybe you own the land and you see it appreciating in the future. I, I-, I don't know, but uh, that's definitely something that's kind of up in the air in terms of things like that. And and I was just trying to pick your brain a little bit there as to where, yeah. where you stand on that. Well, you know, I, I think you're right. I, I, I think that there is a, there is a, a factor there that, um, you know, it is it is nice to have that extra revenue, you know, especially in the springtime when it's, you know, in in western Wisconsin, up up in the north, um, you know, sometimes we don't get a <laughs> the phone's ringing. Sorry. Sometimes we don't get a, um, a an early spring, but we can be out, you know, doing things, growing plants and things like that. And the nursery opens up and gives us a, an open revenue. Um, you know, right away in the springtime, which is nice, you know, selling, selling annuals and things like that. And, and, uh, you know, just getting the ball rolling, it helps. Granted, there is a lot of bills that come in the springtime, you know, cause we, we, we fork out quite a bit of cash to, to buy all the plants and everything. So it, it is a, it is a, you know, a double-edged sword there too. Um, so that, that's where some of the, the, the discussion comes from, you know, whether or not, you know, putting up all that money and just breaking even makes sense. Um, or just, but I, I really, I really don't want to have to drive 45 minutes one way through the city, the the twin cities to, to get all my plants every time I need something. So I think it's going to stay, I'm sure. But what about customers coming in there? Do you, do you find you get any leads into your business from retail customers coming in there or, or not? Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, uh, a lot of times someone will, will find us, we don't do a lot of, um, marketing and I mean, we're in a somewhat small town. I think there's maybe 10 to 12,000 people, depending on whether or not the the college is in, in session. So we're in a somewhat small town and we're relatively unknown to, to new people that are coming to town because we, all we really have is a, a large sign out on the highway that kind of points them down halfway, you know, half mile down the road to the nursery. We don't put any ads out or anything. We have a, obviously a Google page. So if someone, you know, Google's nursery in the area, um, they'll find us, but you know, so, so we'll have new P new customers that come and say, Oh, wow, this is great. You guys have a, an awesome um, yard and things like that. Do you do landscaping? Because, we have signage and things that says, you know, what type of construction and things that we do. So, um, yeah, certainly, certainly get some, um, some new customers from that, um, which is nice. Um, and, and the other nice thing about having the, the nursery and the display gardens is, you know, to show potential customers or our, you know, the, the designs that we're doing or, or things like that, our clients can come and, and actually see the pavers that, you know, that we're, that we're proposing or some of the plants or, you know, we've had plants in the ground for 15, 20 years. So you can walk around the front yard and say, here's what it looks like in the pot out in the nursery. And we, and I can walk you over here and show you, here's what it looks like in 15 years. So you can kind of get a sense of, you know, the, the, the size and scale of the, the certain plants or whatever it is. So, um, that, that is nice, but yeah, yeah, we certainly do get, uh, quite a bit of, you know, walk, walk in customers that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's actually really interesting to be able to use that space just like that. And, you know, that is a, a sales tool and, and a way to bring in leads. Now, you guys, you guys do it all. You guys uh, have some incredible projects. We were just talking about the one that you have on the go right now, that, uh, that driveway entrance, but you guys, you know, you're a full complete design build. Um, where, we talked about leads coming in to the nursery. Where do you see the majority of your leads coming into you at this point in time in your business? Um, well, having been around for 42 years, um, we have actually quite a lot, a lot of repeat business where we, um, we maybe installed a, a landscape 20 years ago and it's, you know, getting to the point, I think 15, 20 years is maybe the max life time um, that you could expect from a, from a from a landscape um not so much hardscapes but but planting so we do get a lot of repeat um you know customers that we've had in the past 
Also, um, you know, referrals from other customers are, have been, uh, you know, something that that's really driven, um, our client base. And then also, uh, obviously using, using our, our website and, and Google AdWords um, have been, you know, a source of kind of new clients. Um, but I would say I, I just rebuilt the website um, this, this year. I, I think the last time I did it was maybe seven years ago or something like that. Um, and I used the WordPress um, and I've actually, I've been really impressed with that. Um, and I think it, it was it was easy to make a nice website. Um, I didn't make it, but I helped design it. Um, but my 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 web builder um, designed, I think, what looks like a really nice website, and um, that that's been helpful. Where I can kind of incorporate a lot of new projects on that simply. Um, where in the past it was hard to kind of upload pictures and things like that. So that's that's been huge, just being able to um, to keep up that way. And, and, uh, you know, as far as Instagram goes, I'm still waiting for my, for my big, huge Instagram sale. I haven't had that yet. <laughs> <laughs> I put a lot of time into it, but I, I've, I've had a few leads from it. Um, I think I have a lot of people that are kind of silently watching at least I think. Um, and, uh, and so I'm still waiting on that, that big sale from Instagram, but, um, no, I, I would say our website is probably the big one. And then um, the, the, the small amount of money that I spend on Google, um, just to, to, to kind of be up front in front of somebody that's Googling landscaping in my area. So have you ever, have you played with uh, Facebook ads at all? I have. Um, and I, I guess Facebook hasn't been, I know Richard, um, I listened to Richard from RC Outdoor and he said that um, he uses Facebook quite a bit and I haven't had the success on Facebook. I guess I haven't put as much time maybe as I maybe should have into it. Um, most of my posts that, that I use on Instagram go directly to my Facebook business page. Um, but I guess I haven't seen the, uh, the payback on, on that quite as much. Um, and I haven't really spent a lot of uh, money on ads. So um, that's something maybe I should look into. Gotcha. Gotcha. So getting into when a, a lead hits your business, yeah, what, w- however they contact you, where do you take that from there? Do you have any pre-qualifying questions? Uh, does, does it hit somebody else and then come to you once they've been pre-qualified? Like what's that, that sort of strategy like for you guys? Well, typically, um, so I get a lead off my website. I get a, an email that kicks back, and I have I have basically a simple questionnaire. It's it's your name, your address, you know, what are you looking for? There's some check boxes on you know you know different types of things that would happen on a landscaping job. I have a, a budget drop down. It says how what is your budget, and it's like it starts at three thousand and goes to eight thousand, and then maybe nine to fifteen. 15 and up, you know, 25. It, so, so you have, they have to choose their budget. Um, and then I, I, I have a little, you know, have them just fill out a little snippet about what are you looking for? What do you need, you know, landscaping wise? And then from there, um, I try to get back, back to, to somebody as, as quickly as possible, whether or not, I think it's going to be a good lead, uh, or not. I try to respond as quick as I can. Um, because I know in this day and age, um, people are, they, they want something, you know, that they want to be satisfied immediately. So I try, I try to, I try to get back to them as soon as I can. Um, and then, and then from there, you know, if it looks like a good lead, I, I call them and kind of feel them out. I think it's, it's something that um, over time and with experience, you kind of get a sense of whether or not you, th- after you start talking with them and they start talking, you ask questions like, um, you, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about the project? Because a lot of times you don't get the full story on that first email. Um, and then once they start talking, you can kind of get a sense of whether or not they're calling three other landscapers for just, a, a you know, to get the lowest price or if they've really um, kind of vetted you and they they want to hire earthworks. I mean, 
after after just a couple simple questions, I think I can typically figure that out. Um, not always, but um, and then from there, um, you know, let's just let's keep going. It sounds like a good lead. I might, you know, right from that uh, right from that initial interview uh, phone interview, I might say, okay, well, I have I have time, you know, this week or whatever day I can swing out and take a look and. Um, th does that sound okay? And then from there, we can do a, a, what I call a walk and talk meeting and, and come out to the site, walk around. You can, you can show me and tell me what you're thinking and I can interject some of my professional opinion and some of my ideas. And then from there, we can, de we can decide on a design price. Um, other times, if it doesn't sound like such a great lead, I might not even call them. I might just send them an email right back and say, you know, if it if it seems to me like it's it's a job where they're looking for for the lowest price, I'll I'll send send them back an email that says um, certainly you know interested and um, I could come out and take a look at things. We do charge a, a consultation fee um, of whatever I f I guess I feel like. Typically, it's around seventy five dollars to come and take a look at your project, and and then from there I can quote you a design. So that weeds out a lot of the tire kickers i think um sometimes i'll get someone that says yeah that's fine come on out if if that's the case and i end up getting the project or or we do some work for them i typically don't charge them that but i use that um consultation fee as a kind of a tool um to to further uh you know qualify somebody because I don't have time to, we're, we're, bit, we're busy enough as it is. I don't have time to be going around and, and doing a lot of pro bono um, type work uh, as far as like getting bids out to people and things like that. Um, and and I, have, I have some, some guys that, that used to work for me that have landscaping businesses that if, if I think that sounds like a good job, you know, for for them, I, I can I can send a couple uh, uh, referrals out to them, and and those guys could you know they're a little bit smaller than we are, don't have as much overhead, and those are kind of perfect jobs for them. So it's nice to have have that and be able to refer um, some of those guys' um, work too. So yeah, and with that, um, I, I like that you use the the charging of consultations as another pre qualifier, and obviously you guys have been around for some time, so you have a little bit more authority when it comes to charging for a consultation like that. You mentioned when leads are coming in uh, uh, on your website, they, they have a choice of, you know, certain price points in terms of their budget. Do you guys have a, a, a price point that works best for your business to take on, like a job that you would want to do again and again and again in your business if you could and, and in a price point, like price range for that job that fits best for your business? I love the, the one day jobs where we can go in, build a small patio and be in and out in a day or a day and a half and don't have to worry about weather. We don't have to worry about all the other things that can happen um, on a large job. Um, so, so those are, those are nice, but I think the bread and butter, the ones that I enjoy, the ones that I think are profitable, um, are those two, three, four day jobs that are maybe 20, $25,000 jobs that we can maybe bang out a couple in a week. Um, those between that and, and just having a, a few other, you know, one day jobs, uh, on the, on the books, um, Th those are kind of the the good ones in my opinion a project like the one we're on right now um where we did a you know a paver pool deck and a huge paver driveway and and you know a big water feature and things like that we've been on that job since about mid september um so we've been on a job for about a month now luckily we've had dry weather but I mean, those are the types of jobs that can really get strung out and you can probably lose more money than you know, um, you know, if you didn't bid it right. Um, so so I, I think those couple day, two, three, four day jobs are, are kind of the ones that that I really like to like to have. 
So one thing I don't get into enough on this podcast because of time usually is, you know, this, the crews that the people that you have in your crews and the amount of crews that you have, Mm -hmm. like kind of your business structure. So my question is how many crews do you have? And do you have crews that you'll combine on a big job like this to, you know, knock it out or, uh, do you have a, a crew that does large jobs and a crew that does small jobs? How does that work for you? Well, so we're basically, we're a pretty small company, I guess, in the grand scheme of things. Um, I only have enough equipment for, for two crews. Um, so I have uh, two one-ton dump trucks and, and two international, um, you know, 40, 4500s. And uh, so I in a couple skid loaders. So, I mean, I can only run two crews at a time on a project like this. It's, it's a little different because when I have, excuse me, when I have two crews, it's typically in the summertime, we are um, blessed to have a, a, a great um, college, uh, UW University of Wisconsin River Falls here in, in town. Um, so there's always, some college kids that are looking for outdoor work. So, so we're, we're, we're blessed with that. And I've, and I've ran into uh, the last couple of years, a couple um, three football players that came to me and wanted a job. And, and that's been working out great where, you know, um, we'll, we'll have, you know, strong college kids in the summertime. And I've got a couple lead guys and, and, um, and another full-time guy besides myself that, that are so there's four of us if you if you count me that are full time and then there's and then there's um some some part time summer help it it in the summertime I'd say we're two crews but like in the springtime and before school is out um and and now in the fall it, it's it's part timers I, I a couple of my college kids are still working part time a few days a week it, it I guess it kind of depends um you know what time of year it is. And that kind of provides a little bit more context into, you know, how you guys operate. And before I kind of went off on that uh, tangent or there with that question, we were talking more, we were talking about leads coming into your business and in your sales process, charging for consultations, that initial meeting. Um, Where do you take it after that initial meeting? What questions are you asking on that initial meeting to know what you're going to put into a design or what you're going to include on a quote? And and where do you take it after that? I like to get the ball rolling by just having the customer kind of walking around their yard and and showing me, um, you know, things that they they do or don't like about the yard and then starting to to have the conversation about let's just say that they they think they want a patio i one of the qualifying things is okay well what do you plan on using the patio space for is it going to be for a fire pit area do you entertain a lot um things like that and just get them talking and then from there let's say okay well we'd like to have friends over how many friends do you typically have you know, at, at one of these get togethers. Well, we, we maybe have six or eight people. Okay. Well, that tells me from experience that you need a patio that is X amount of square feet. And, and that size patio would be in the vicinity of X between this number and that number. Um, so, so we get to start, we start talking about pricing a little bit. So they're not, surprised when I show them a plan, you know, and here's the number um, that they, they don't have the sticker shock. So, so that helps a lot, but just really getting them to talk a lot and listen to kind of what their needs are. Um, and then from there, de- develop a concept plan typically, um, which, you know, a lot of times doesn't end up needing a lot of tweaks because I've, I've kind of really listened to what their needs are um, and, and I guess ask the right questions. Um, so I'm not spending a lot of time doing, you know, design redos. Um, but after we have that initial meeting, I'll sit down, I'll come up with what I typically just call a concept design um, and, and then meet with them again, whether or not it's at our office or I go to their house 
Um, it really kind of depends on the project um, and get some feedback from them. You know, sometimes they say, yep, it looks great. Give me a price. Other times, well, can we change this, change that? So once everybody's happy with the plan, then we come up with a, you know, a, a, a quote for the, for the design. And it's kind of all broken down a la carte. It's not just a simply landscaping plan installed price. It's um, it breaks it down, plants installed, mulch installed, patio installed, retaining wall installed. So they, they don't, they don't get to see what the labor is, but they, they get, they get kind of an a la carte thing so they can pick and choose. Okay. Maybe I don't want the landscape lighting or I want to phase that out. This is what, you know, that would be, that would reduce the price by X amount or whatever. So, um, that's, that's kind of the process, um, that, that we take. Do you find customers really appreciate that kind of breakdown on on the invoice or on the quote that they can kind of uh, pick and choose things to suit their budget or decide if they want to add things? Yeah, it, it makes um, it makes phasing. I mean, obviously, like a, a really nice backyard patio maybe is not attainable for everybody. So so sometimes you you have customers that want to phase things out and, you know, that the breaking it down that way does help with with that and and i can make suggestions okay phase one i think needs to be the wall and the patio and the edging or whatever whatever it is and and we can break it down and say okay your budget is fifteen thousand this year we can do this this and this and then phase two i think a good way to do phase two would be to do the landscape lighting or whatever you know it is as long as we know kind of what where we're going you know long term then then we can kind of help phase it out that way too so that's something that we do see um quite a bit i would say um where we'll do phases um because i mean let's face it these these projects do end up you know being pretty nice projects and and they do be they do become expensive once in a while too so um you know, it, it, it helps, it helps things if, if you can help them through the process and, and help with their budget and things like that by phasing, phasing things out like that. So, yeah. And especially when a customer is tight against their budget to be able to introduce that, you know, we can break this down in phases and make it a lot easier. It's, it's almost like financing a project without, mm -hmm. you know, them being able to enjoy the space, but at least, you know, it really breaks it down for them and it, it, it kind of helps them to meet the needs of their budget a bit more. Do you, do you find that uh, you have customers kind of opting for that, that phasing approach? Is, is that something that you guys try to uh, speak to customer, customers about when they might be tight against their budget? It, I guess it really depends on the customer and the, and the project. Um, but it, 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 it does the way that we have our, um, our quotes laid out, it does make that easier, uh, the discussion a little bit easier. So I, I wouldn't say that we, we try to approach it that way, but you know, some, some customers, you know, they, they, they have expensive taste and they, they can't afford everything all at once. So, um, you know, it, it really, I guess it depends when uh when the customer is ready to sign uh a big thing is payment plans and you know especially for these bigger projects that we were talking about that you know a bigger project might bring you into next year how, how do you schedule payment plans with the customer uh like that typically so this big one that we're on right now um it's actually the biggest project that we've ever done before um and I, I basically sat down with the customer and I said, we'll come up with a, we'll, we'll come up with a payment plan and, you know, whatever you guys are comfortable with, I was thinking about a third down. So, so I approached them with that and they said, that sounds great. We'll get started with a third down. And then I said, you know, we'll hit certain benchmarks and then I'll probably be to the point where I have so much material on site that I'm, I have bills coming and I'm going to have to start paying for, for all this material. We'll hit these benchmarks. You know, I'll, I'll let's say I'll get the, the pool deck done or um, part of the driveway gets installed and then, you know, we'll, we'll hit another third or something like that. And then um, if, if winter, if winter comes and I have to come, you know, stop working, then 
essentially all I would ask for is, is that I get paid to, to up to date of what I've installed, you know, and, and then start again in the springtime. So, um, but, but most cases I'll take 50% down on a, you know, let, let's say we're doing a $20,000 patio install or something like that. I'll take 50% down and then the other 50%, you know, uh, I'll send them a bill and, and hopefully they'd pay me within 30 days. So, um, typically that that's what it is. It's half down and then half when we're done. So, um, bigger projects though, we, we break it down a little different, um, just because I don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank to, to be strung out on. So, and speaking of payment plans is typically leads into one of our next questions, but you know, this, this can be really anything that you, you want to draw from because for as long as you've been in business for been in the industry for, I'm sure that you have had horror stories in your business uh, or within this industry. Do you have one in particular that you'd want to share with our audience? Um, yeah, I've, I've been thinking about that. Um, and th there was a, there was a project about three years ago. Um, it was a substantial project at the time for us, um, a big retaining wall installation, block wall, um, it was, I don't know, 50 pallets a block or something like that. And, um, you know, a lot of different tiers and things like that. And the customer, um, you know, a, a, approached us. We got the lead from another customer of ours. It was his uncle. Um, and the project was a little bit further away than what we typically uh, travel. Um, I think it was maybe... 35 or 40 minutes one way, which is a little bit further away than I like to, to travel. So that was kind of strike one, but it was a big enough project where it made sense for us to, to, to do it. Um, and the customer at the time, you know, seemed like a good customer um, in, in, you know, there wasn't any really red flags um, and, the, the whole time, the, the process of building the retaining walls and, the, and there's a, a lot of patio, uh, paver patio work and things like that, there wasn't a lot of hiccups in the project. Um, but it was one of those late fall projects where we didn't, we didn't complete, we got all the hardscaping done, um, but didn't do the, the plantings and things. We were going to come back in the springtime. Well, over the and we we had been paid about 90 percent of of this project and um over the the last couple of weeks we we weren't getting that last payment we got an email from them saying um we think that the steps that you built are are too narrow we used a 12 inch bullnose step and i had laid it out ahead of time i had completely laid out you know what what it's going to look like here's here's what a step would look like with a bull nose on the top of it and things like that well they decided that the steps weren't deep enough um the tread the tread wasn't deep enough and they they wanted it changed and i've kind of i kind of dug my heels in and said we agreed to this um and now you're changing things we can certainly do the change but it's going to cost extra because this is a kind of a change order type of thing well they didn't see it that way um and they weren't going to pay the the remainder of of the of the bill um so instead of uh so this guy little backstory was a was a lawyer i think he was retired um and i i didn't at the time didn't feel comfortable getting uh, involved in, in any sort of lawsuit. Um, and I just kind of had a bad feeling like this could go, this could go south. Um, so we ended up basically just um, washing our hands of it and, you know, didn't really argue. We said, here's what it's going to cost if you want it changed. Um, here's what you owe us but we didn't really pursue that and never got the last payment from them. So that was one of those deals where I think um, in hindsight, you know, maybe should have really spent more time um, with the customer 
you know, going over what they should expect, I guess, um, material wise and, and things like that. They started, they started living with this in the winter time and decided, you know, it was a little harder than they thought it was going to be to shovel and things like that. They could have said something simply while we were building it. Um, and we could have made a simple change, which wouldn't have cost hardly any extra money. But since every, all, everything was all glued up and everything, I mean, it was, it was going to be kind of a nightmare to tear apart and redo. We could have certainly done it, um, but it was just one of those things where I kind of dug my heels in, like I said, and I said, no, this is, this is not what we agreed to. You guys kind of okayed this um, from the get-go, um, and they weren't willing to pay it, and I wasn't really willing to, to go do the the changes um and i i i i ended up losing quite a bit of money on the on the deal but it was just one of those things where it was a learning experience i think for me um so i i guess i the one thing i would say to to somebody that's listening is just you know try to do your best at explaining to the customer what they're going to get um and you know even laying things out so everybody's kind of on the same page because i you know i've done this so many so many times and so many different projects where i can i can see what's what it's going to be before it's even done and the customer this is their first time ever dealing with a hardscaping project like that you know they have no idea what to expect so I guess the, the, the more conversations and, you know, um, and even like 3d design and things like that really help a lot. I think people visualize things. Um, so I don't know, it was just one of those things where, where I said, I I don't want to deal with the headache. I can, I can take the hit money wise, not have to go through litigation and things like that. Um, and I, I don't know if it was the right decision or not. It was just one of those things where it was, it was a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, unfortunately for us, a lot of the times that is the easiest decision is just to wash your hands. Yeah. In it. And yeah. it, it, it generally is, it, it generally is a money, uh, you know, it mm-hmm. comes down to money and uh, it's difficult, but I, yeah, I, I would agree with you. And it, great advice in terms of, you know, how to, best prepare yourself I guess when dealing with customers like that or just customers in general because sometimes we we've been in this for a while we know exactly what it's going to look like we just need to be able to communicate that with our customers right that can be difficult for sure yeah yeah and you know losing losing a significant amount of money on a project like that it hurts but I don't know what would have happened. I could have gone into litigation and, you know, him being a lawyer and things like that, who knows what could have happened. It could have ended up costing me a lot more than that. And I would have had to go back and fix it or something like that. I don't know what could have happened. So, I mean, you know, it was just one of those things where I, I said, well, we'll just, we'll take a hit this time and hopefully we'll make it back on another one or something. Definitely. Definitely. So, you know, getting into a, a probably a more fun topic, equipment, tools, and, and things that, you know, the toys that we enjoy on the job site. What are some things that you live by in your business? Things that are already in your business, tools, equipment that you love for installation, or even uh, things that are on the horizon in your business that you're really looking forward to invest in? Well, one thing that I'm I'm really looking forward to demoing, I think, as soon as this driveway gets done being installed, is a Weber roller compactor. I'm super excited to demo that. Um, we do quite a bit of larger format, I guess. Not, not it. I'd say we do enough large format pavers where I think it might make sense for me to own a roller compactor and. One of the sales reps in, you know, in my area that I deal with quite a bit, um, my county material sales rep said, once you get this thing, you're going to love it. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to that. But other tools, you know, like um, vacuum air lifters and, um, 
you know, anything that, that makes us more efficient, uh, the, the, the screed pull, pullers from um, Probst uh, and Pave Tool, anything that Pave Tool has, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of a, a I, like to, I like to have the, the newer, you know, what's, what's new, what's going to make me faster, what's going to make me more efficient. So there's been some tools that I've, I've bought and maybe, you know, tried out and didn't, didn't pan out, but um, there's, there's been some other things that have really helped us uh, quite a bit um, efficiency wise. Um, I'm, I'm just about probably going to buy another air lifter here. I have one that I bought this spring. Um, but with this big driveway job, I've realized that it would be nice to have a couple of the, of, of them. Um, and, you know, obviously the, the machinery, the trucks, um, I'm going to, I'm going to get a couple new one ton dump trucks, um, and get them set up the, the way that I like them, um, with the dump bodies and, and things this fall. I think some of our, our equipment, you know, it's, it's getting to the point where it's a little bit older um, and, you know, starting to become a little bit more of a maintenance, uh, you know, thing. So I'm going to get it. I'm going to sell a couple of dump trucks and, and get a couple of new um, one ton dump trucks. I'm probably going to get a new skid loader this year. Um, one of my, my Bobcat T180 is getting to the point where, um, it's still a really good skid, but, um, you know, we need something a little bit bigger. So I'm going to get a, a larger, I think size, um, skid loader. I've been demoing, I I've demoed two or three different types of skid loaders in the last, uh, month or so, just trying to get, figure out which one I want. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there's always, there's always toys and fun things, um, you, you know, th that are out there. I think uh, the 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 one thing about all these toys is that um, they're going to show up to work on time. They're not going to be hung over um, and things like that. So you know anything that that I can buy or or invest in that's that's going to do the job. You know faster, better, um, with with less. Uh, you know, headaches and things like that. One other thing I think uh, I want to really consider, um, or or I've 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 uh, rented um, the 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 walk behind mini skid steers. Um, I think that might be something that could be on the horizon. But you know, the the mini excavator, the skid loaders, the dump trucks, those are all things that you know really help. Um, in a landscaping business, obviously. What makes you pull the trigger on a decision like, uh, you know, purchasing that next skid steer or deciding that it's time to upgrade your trucks or even uh, deciding on something as simple as a uh, the roller compactor? What is it that, that makes you decide that th this is the next thing I'm gonna buy, inv invest in? I guess, I guess some things maybe come out of necessity, but I'm, I'm just, I'm just the type of person that, that loves to have, um, new, nice equipment, uh, not so much new trucks and skid loaders, but something that comes along the horizon, like the roller compactor, um, I'm going to certainly demo that thing and then strongly consider buying it just because, the place that I have to rent it from is, is an hour away. It doesn't cost me a whole lot to rent, but having to rent that on every project and drive one hour each way to go and drop it off. Um, I don't think it's, if I, if I end up liking it and I think it's going to make us um, better, I'm going to crack less pavers. It's going to be faster to compact. You know, it, it all comes down to efficiency and whether or not I think it's going to make me money. Um, is the biggest thing. Um, you know, it's, it's that mantra, you got to spend money to make money, um, type of thing. So it, it, there's always, there's always the given, and, give and take too, though, because there's always, there's always things that, that I want. And, um, being in a family business, I, I don't have the final say on whether or not this is going to be a purchase that we make. 
um, especially on some of the bigger ticket items. Um, so, you know, I sit down with my wife and my dad and talk about some of those things. And is this really going to make us better? You know, for a long time, for the last three or four years, really ever since I, I tried out a, a big, um, a bigger mini excavator, John Deere, uh, 60G with a, with a CMP rotator on it. I'm like, I need one of these things, but it's a hundred thousand dollars. Um, and my wife and my dad are kind of the, the voice of reason on some of those big things, um, where I might, you know, get into a little bit of trouble and a little bit more debt than, than we might be comfortable with. Um, <laughs> if I'm the one that gets to, to spend the money all the time, but, uh, um, but that, that would be something that, that would be, would be nice to have. I could do a lot more, um, large scale boulder walls, um, uh, you know, limestone outcrop walls and things like that. But the other, the other thing is I, I sat through a, a talk, a techo block thing where Paver Pete was there and he, he's always big on renting things like, you don't have to deal with the maintenance. You don't have to deal with breakdowns and things like that. You know, the rental company deals with all the, all the, the bad parts of owning equipment and you, you can just have a machine that's ready to go. Um, and if you just base it, you know, into your quotes, um, th then you'll be fine. And, and there's a lot to be said about that. Something like a, a mini excavator with a CMP rotator or a, any type of rotator. Encon makes an awesome rotator. Um, things like that. Maybe it makes sense just to rent stuff like that. But like the roller compactor that cost me 75 bucks to rent and drive two hours every time I need it, you know, for 4,000 or whatever it costs, maybe it makes sense for me to just own that thing because it's going to last forever. So, um, I don't know, just, just some of those things that, that we have conversations about. Um, I don't know if I'll ever get my 60 G, uh, with the rotator, but I, I know I can rent it and I know how much it costs to rent. So, yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot to be said about renting. Uh, I, I'm a big prop proponent of renting equipment in my business, especially, especially for other people. Uh, I think there's a lot of, you know, math to be done to see if it's right for you, but um, especially for you guys, because you guys are in a, you know, a situation in your business where, like you said, you operate a nursery too. And as soon as spring comes, you guys have uh, an investment to do in terms of right. stock. So you guys have a real cash flow. Um, you know, you really have to manage your cash flow appropriately to be able to plan for that. And even when you have a project like you have now that might take you into next year to be able to plan for that as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's totally right. And, and that is one thing that we've always tried to do. And one thing that I've learned from my dad is that, um, you don't really want to be in too much debt. You don't want to string yourself out too far. Um, I've seen a lot of companies come and go over the course of however long I've been doing this, where they'll get really big, really fast, and they'll have all new equipment and, you know, shiny new trucks and everything. But something like the 2007 2008 recession comes along and they've got no work and a ton of payments to make um and it's pretty soon they're not around anymore so um th there is something to be said about about that not not stringing yourself out too much um and really just kind of operating within your means um you know, something a mantra that, that my dad is, has taught me and I, I really has re resonated with me um, as much as I would like to go out and spend the big the big bucks on on some of that nice stuff. You know, there is some reserve there that, that I've held back on um, just just knowing that I don't want to be going into next year, not knowing exactly like the beginning of this year in March, we had no idea what was going to happen. We didn't know we were going to have one of the best years we've ever had, you know, in March, it was, it was touch and go. Um, and emailing customers saying, are you guys still, do you still want us to come and do this? And, you know, having some customers back out and stuff like that. Um, we don't know what's going to happen next year. It's always something in the back of our mind. Um, and I don't want to have, 
a bunch of payments in the springtime and not have any work. You know what I mean? Cause that could, that could make or break a lot of, a lot of guys. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and speaking of, you know, people you've learned from or have taken mantras from, do you have any mentors or people, uh, whether online, offline that you network with, get inspiration from that you'd want to shout out? Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, the, there's all always the the usual suspects. You know, the the, the big guys on Instagram. Um, you know, Caleb and Sean and and Andy and and Richard and and those guys that we that you've talked to uh, on the podcast. Um, but there's there's some other guys too that um, that I that I typically um, talk to. You know, if not uh, weekly, um, Todd at campus, campus landscape down in Florida, Andy at flow pavers down in, down in Florida, um, Danny at niche gardens, um, Trevor, my, my county material sales rep. Um, there's, there's a bunch of guys in the industry. Um, and you know, being, being in the business for so long, I've, I've made a lot of connections, um, with other contractors you know, and it's, it, it's always nice to be able to, to pick up the phone and, you know, say like today, I, I called one of my best friends who's an electrician. And I said, I'm, I'm buying uh, a couple new dump trucks. What do you think about this? And, and he said, hold on, let me, let me talk to this other concrete contractor that we both know. And, and pretty soon, you know, I'm talking to, to him. And so it's always nice to have those connections in the industry, but, uh, yeah, a couple, a couple of those guys, uh, that I follow on Instagram have been really, um, really helpful too. It's, it's, it's really all about networking, Mike. I mean, with, with everything that you're doing on this podcast and, and your, um, page on Instagram, it's great for the industry. I think it's, it's awesome. Um, I love listening to all these other guys talk about business and everything. Um, I mean, it's, it's what I live. It's, it's, it's everything (laughs) that, that I think about most of the, you know, every day. So, so it's great to, to, to have that, um, too. So I really appreciate you doing all that. I appreciate you. And, uh, you know, you've shown us support almost from the beginning and I appreciate that. And I appreciate, uh, you know, just having you on the show and you taking the time out of your day. Cause I know you're a busy man. I know, uh, you've got a family and not just you, but everybody that's really kind of come on this show. It's, uh, it means a lot that people are willing to give up their time, uh, especially as business owners to, to spread their, the information that they know to the industry. Right. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's, it's important, um, that, that we, that we share things like this. Um, you know, it, it makes us all better. Um, you know, you and I have kind of kicked around some, some things too, some ideas about, you know, maybe, uh, just everybody kind of putting their heads together and, um, you know, you know, furthering the industry and just making everybody better. I think it's just great. Um, you know, there's really, there's really no secrets. Uh, everybody deals with all this stuff and, and it's, it's always nice to, to know that, um, you know, we might not be the only one that did this or that or doing something right or wrong. Um, it's, it's just great to hear from everybody. So super stoked about it. Absolutely. And as we wind this interview down here, Nick, I got one last question for you. And that is if there's one thing that you wish you'd known from the very beginning, when you started your business, when you uh, became in control of your business, you know, that one thing that you wish you'd know that, you know, now, from that very beginning time, what would that be? Um, I'd say probably save more money for retirement. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, if I would have started, you know, it, this is, it's not an easy job. You know, you, you break down fast. It, it's fast paced. There's a lot of stress involved. Um, I don't want to be doing this forever. Um, I love what I do. I just don't want to be doing it you know, forever. So I think saving for retirement, um, early on, uh, you know, would, would, would be, would be something I probably would have, uh, would have been nice to, to think about back then. Um, and just maybe mechanizing faster. Um, you know, 
when my dad started the business, they used to dig edging by hand. They used to shovel truckloads of rock, you know, five yards at a time. Um, so, you know, I guess, I guess that gave me a good work ethic, but just maybe mechanizing faster. So we, we don't break down our bodies don't break down quite as fast. Um, those would be a couple of things that I think I, I would have, would have been nice to know back then. Excellent. Excellent advice to end off that interview with. And Nick, where can our audience learn more about what you've got going on online? Where, they, where can they find you? Uh, at Earthworks Landscaping RF on Instagram and Facebook, uh, earthworkslandscaping.com. Um, you know, if you want to reach out, I'd be, I'd be certainly happy to, to talk to anybody about anything. Just shoot me a message on any one of those social medias um and uh you know just just thanks a lot for having me on the program mike um looking forward to to listening to to everybody else too